I'm Bob Woodson, president of the Woodson Center. I'm here to talk about race and economics. These two issues in America did not converge until the 1960s with some pretty devastating effects that I'll discuss in my remarks. But the character of any nation or any individual is determined by how we treat the least of us. In America, the moral barometer is how we've treated blacks in America and also low-income people. Just a little history of that. Prior to the 1960s, the responsibility for caring for uh, those who are in need in various ethnic groups and racial groups was the responsibility of private institutions within those groups. Immigrants coming from the backwaters of Eastern and Southern Europe, they came here. The first requirement was to become acculturated and also they must be assimilated. And assimilation meant they had to learn the language and learn the customs and acculturation they had to learn the customs and of, of the country as well. Well, the large cities proved to be a melting pot in a place of assimilation took place and the civic institutions within these communities, these cities, did a great job of producing Americans out of these immigrants. In a black community, the same process emerged that even under segregation and discrimination, there was a rich array of civic institutions, churches, Masonic organizations that rose up within the groups to provide for those in need. One of the largest was in Philadelphia during Free Blacks in 1789, Mother Bethel Church. But even among Free Blacks who sought assistance from their church, there were high moral standards for people who qualified for aid. You couldn't get assistance if your poverty or your situation was caused by your own slothfulness or immorality. So, so high standards were always required for those receiving aid. And this continued up until the 1930s with the crash of the stock, stock market. Um, pressure mounted on these institutions that they very, could not continue to provide for their people. And so government intervened for the first time in the economy on behalf of low-income people and people who are struggling. But intervention was largely government to in individuals. And so as a result, these civic institutions pretty much stayed intact. Until the 1960s, this all changed. For the black community, up until 1965, 85% of all households had a man and a woman raising children. But a lot of that changed in the 60s after the Voting Rights Act passed and we had the Watts riots occurred. And Lyndon Johnson announced his war on poverty. As a result of these events, social scientists, liberal social scientists at Columbia University School of Social Work, Clowen and Piven, came up with this social construct that says that the black community, if we want to really emphasize the, the contradictions of capitalism, that one of the ways that we can do that is to insist that blacks, welfare to blacks, be given as reparations. And at the time, public aid to blacks was really stigmatized in the black community. To overcome that stigmatization, the social scientists at the time began to promote the notion that the nuclear family was Eurocentric and therefore racist. They concluded that if we can separate work from income and replace it with welfare, it would make the fathers redundant in homes. Well, this social construct was supported by the black power movement that saw the nuclear family too as Eurocentric. Also, welfare policies were destigmatized. It was considered reparations. But just having a social policy alone was not enough. The federal government, through the opportunity offices or the poverty programs, actually opened government offices and actively recruited 
blacks into the welfare system. Uh, privacy laws, suits were filed so that women who were pregnant out of wedlock no longer had to declare paternity as a condition of them getting welfare. And so it's the, it's the combination of the events that you saw the explosion of welfare people, millions began to flow into the welfare system. The liberal social scientists concluded that if we could only bankrupt our cities, then the federal government would be compelled to uh, change how we address poverty by having income redistribution. So it was really socialist aims at the time, and the black community was the agent through which they would promote this dramatic change. And as a consequence, millions of blacks flowed into the welfare system at a time in New York when the unemployment rate for black men was under 4%. And so there, what was predicted actually came true. There was an explosion of out of wedlock births. And so that number of black Americans, the, the, the black family formation rates went from 85% to out of wedlock births to 70%. And all the accompanying social pathology followed, dropout rates, violence, um, this, this, this integration of families. All of these pathologies occurred at one time in the black community and in 73, New York City did in fact go bankrupt because of the explosion of welfare. And this decline was used by the left to justify racial antagonism. They said now that these changes uh, that are occurring was a direct result of racial discrimination. 1619 came along in, into, uh, uh, in, in August of 2019. This was really the fulfillment of a policy that started in the 60s, that the 1619 project from the New York Times began to look at the problems facing black America today, the out of wedlock births, the explosion of black-on-black -black crime. More blacks were killed in one year uh, by other blacks than were killed in 40 years under the, uh, lynchings in the South. In other words, black Americans' uh, uh, neighborhoods had a 9-11 every six months. And so the, the architects of 1619 associated those changes with a legacy of slavery and discrimination. And they said because the, the real birthday of America is 1619, that, that, that was a date that in Jamestown, 20 African slaves arrived. And so America should be defined not from 1776, but 1619 at the arrival of slavery. And America is incurably racist and all white people are villains and therefore to be punished and all blacks are villains, I mean victims, to be compensated. And that became the dominant narrative that replaced the civil rights proposition that we should be judged by the content of our character and not the color of our skin, but that has now been replaced with intersectionality and, and race grievance is the primary definition of what social activists are engaged in today. And so what we at the Woodson Center are doing with our 1776 pro, uh, campaign, what we're doing with the 1776 campaign is we're challenging this notion that America should be defined by its birth defect of slavery but America should be defined by its promise of equal opportunity. And what we're doing by assembling scholars and activists, because it's not enough to challenge the intellectual framework of what 1619 did, because we believe that experience will always triumph over an argument. Therefore, what we have recruited is not only black scholars, that, that are presenting essays to repudiate the, the statements in 1619, but also we're bringing along activists 
whose lives are the embodiment of the founding principles of personal responsibility. And so to, to challenge this notion, we have given evidence, for instance, in, in 1920 to 1940, the education gap in the South between blacks and whites was eighth grade for whites, it was fifth grade for blacks. But because Julius Rosenwald, the Jewish CEO of Sears, partnered with Booker T. Washington, and Rosenwald put up $4 million, and the black community raised $4.8 million, and together, this partnership, the black community built 5,000 Rosenwald schools in the Deep South to provide education to untutored and uneducated blacks. And as a consequence of this effort, within, between 1920 and 1940, just 20 years, the education gap in the South closed from three years to six months. When blacks were denied access to hotels, they built their own hotels. In every major city, there was a major hotel. In Chicago, Illinois, for instance, in 1929, in the Bronzeville section, Blacks owned 731 businesses. We had $100 million in real estate assets. So all over America, in the presence of discrimination, Black Americans, using the, the instruments of the free enterprise system, pooled their money together in our churches, burial societies, and capitalized their own businesses, and Thrive. They had Black Wall Streets all over America. Throughout the history of this country, Black Americans have fought in every war in defense of the founding principles. And what we should celebrate is their success within the context of this system. If we're going to talk about a legacy of slavery, we should also talk about the legacy of resistance and resilience that blacks resisted by being resilient. For instance, in 1943, there were no black naval officers. So Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of uh, President Roosevelt, insisted that the Navy train naval officers, blacks for naval officers. The Navy selected 16 college-educated black cadets for training. But they decided to give these black cadets in eight weeks what they would give white cadets in 16 weeks. And once the black cadets found out what the Navy was about, they put blankets up over their windows and stayed up all night and studied. And when they were tested, they all scored in the 90th percentile. Well, the Navy, believing that they had cheated, tested them individually. The second time, they scored in the 93rd percentile. And after a few months of hesitation, 13 of them were made officers for the first time. To this day, the scores of these cadets set a record at the academy because they have the highest record, highest score in the history of the Naval Training Academy. Another example from history that we're presenting is a, a man named Robert Smalls, who was born in 1839 in uh, Sumter, North Carolina. He was a slave working on a ship. And one night when uh, his masters went, went to to leave, leave one night when they left the ship, he commandeered the ship, and along with his five other crewmen, they uh, sneaked out of the, uh, the port, picked up their families, and put their master's hat on, and waved and went past five different garrison and turned the supply ship over to the Union Navy. Well, Robert Smalls was celebrated throughout the country and as a consequence of his heroic actions, Lincoln admitted blacks in to fight for the Union Army. Well, after the war, 
Robert Smalls became a successful businessman and got elected to the Congress during Reconstruction. And he went back and purchased the plantation on which he was a slave. And because the family of the slave master had become destitute, in an act of radical grace, he took in the wife and children of the slave master and even allowed her to remain in the master bedroom as she had become delusional and didn't realize that the war was over. And I think that's a marvelous story of the resilience of black Americans to thrive and achieve against the odds, to be born a slave and through the free, free enterprise system, earn enough money to come back and actually purchase a plantation of which he was a slave and exhibited the kind of radical grace that enabled him to take in and care for the family of the slave master. And so we are taking these experiences that are ignored and overlooked by 1619 and presenting these as evidence that America should not ever be defined by its birth defect of slavery, but it should be defined by the promise that he'd held. And that's why people of color from all over the world are risking their lives to get here. And so it is important because the message that is coming from liberal, radical, leftists, and the Black Lives Matter movement is really sending a very dangerous message to not only blacks but whites. And what the message that is being sent to, to blacks is that they are defined by slavery and discrimination. And therefore, if white America doesn't change, it is difficult, impossible for blacks to change. That's making a, an assumption that blacks have no agency and therefore are, are totally dependent. So, but our, our society is at a crossroads right now where race as dominating everything. Contracts between law firms now require that companies uh, sign on to the race grievance training. Um, school systems are being taught history that America is defined by slavery. And so our culture is being polluted by this notion that America is defined by slavery and that it is an exploitative nation, that capitalism is to be disavowed. The Black Lives Matter movement promotes itself as being uh, seeking social justice in, in, in wake of George Floyd being murdered or uh, killed by the police. But what they have done is hijacked the civil rights movement and migrated it from justice for blacks to burning Bibles in Portland, to attempting to desecrate World War II memorials, taking down statues, not of Southern generals, but of luminaries like Frederick Douglass. And so there really is a crisis in America where the radical left is using race and America's birth defect as a bludgeon to tear apart this nation. And so what we believe that should happen as a defense of this nation is that the majority of low-income blacks who are suffering the most in this turmoil that we're putting, they are also the greatest allies in the restoration of this nation. I think there's a myth that the so-called spokespersons for black Americans speaks for the everyday black American. It's just not true. Many of those who command the microphones and are on the talk shows supposed to be representative of the poor. Many of these leaders are against, I mean, are against the police. 80% of the black Americans supports more police in communities. There's always been a bifurcation between the interests of so-called spokesperson and 
low-income people. For instance, on the issue of, of vouchers and choice in education, only 8% of the so-called civil rights leadership supports vouchers. 65 to 70% of low-income blacks support vouchers. And this is true. For instance, in Florida, the 2018 election, gubernatorial election, where DeSantis ran against Gillum, the liberal black uh, former mayor of Tampa, uh, the margin of victory was 32,000 votes. And that's because 100,000 low-income blacks voted for the Republican DeSantis because of his position on choice and vouchers in education. Even though Gillum brought into campaign for him uh, ex-president uh, Obama and Oprah Winfrey, even with Oprah Winfrey and Obama coming to campaign for the black candidate, 100,000 low-income blacks voted the other way because they put the interests of their children's education ahead of race. And I think that is an opening, and you're going to see the same uh, divide as you take specific issues into communities. After all, many of those who are advocating the defunding of the police do not live in neighborhoods that have high crime rates. Many of them live in gated communities, and therefore, they don't have to suffer the consequences of their advocacy. What is it they're trying to do? Because they have no solutions. All they're talking about is what they're against, what they want to abolish, what they want to deconstruct. They offer no remedies. They are saying that the problem of black America is institutional racism. My challenge to them is that what does that mean? Give me an example of institutional racism, and then I want to know what remedy would they apply, and then how would that remedy stop, for instance, the hemorrhage of black-on-black -black death in the inner city? How would it reduce drug addictions among vulnerable populations living in our inner cities? So, so one of the, the, the ways that America can be restored is that if we mobilize within low-income neighborhoods, those people that stand to lose the most. Because now what the left is saying to black America, that you are exempt from any personal responsibility for control of your life, that you can never be agents of your own uplift, that the bourgeois values of hard work, sacrifice, delayed gratification are somehow associated with col colonialism or white suppression, and therefore, to be legitimately black, you must abandon the bourgeois values that enabled Frederick Douglass and many of those who came before us in the past who successfully fought against racial discrimination and oppression by building their own uh, schools, building their own mental uh, uh, hospitals, hotels, educational systems. So the true liberators of this country will be those in whose name Black Lives Matter have, have defamed by their actions. The Golden 13 example and the example of the life of Robert Small are just a, a few examples of what I call radical grace in action and they really exemplify the best that is America. We must come together and deracialize race and desegregate poverty and try to assist all Americans to be the best that we can be. Thank you.